In 1873, the Reverend Samuel Barnett and his wife Henrietta arrived in the East End of London, where he became the vicar of St Jude's Church on Commercial Street. Before Samuel took up the post, Dr John Jackson, the Bishop of London, had warned him to think long and hard about the decision, as, so the bishop informed him, it is the worst parish in my diocese, inhabited mainly by a criminal population, and one which has, I fear, been much corrupted by doles. Recalling their decision to go there, in her biography of her husband, which was written in 1918, Henrietta Barnett wrote that, We did not hurry, but made careful inquiries before deciding. The census returns of 1871 showed that the population of the parish was 6,270, of whom the majority were males, inhabiting 675 houses, many of which were common lodging houses. Through the parish ran one large street, and behind it both east and west lay crowded and insanitary courts and alleys. As they pondered their decision, the Barnets paid a visit to Whitechapel to view their proposed new home. It was one of those warm winter days, Henrietta recalled many years later, when drizzle seems to magnify the noise and make sunshine a distant memory. It was market day, and the main street was filled with hay carts, entangled among which were droves of frightened cattle being driven to the slaughterhouses, then and now sights to shock the sensitive and encourage vegetarianism. The people were dirty and bedraggled, the children neglected, the streets littered and ill-kept, the beer shops full, the schools shut up. Describing the habitations of the people, Henrietta was equally uncomplimentary. They are common lodgings and furnished lodgings. The common lodgings are under police supervision, and certain rules as to cleansing, the number of inmates and the immediate removal of the sick, secure health. They accommodate men at threepence or fourpence a night, the doubles as they are called, having rooms for men and women, as well as for single men. The inmates occupy a common kitchen, and in turn cook their food at the big fire. In this kitchen, some bully often dominates, and the prevailing opinion is that which favours the escape of a thief and laughs over the corruption of the young. The deputy, who is left in charge by the owner, is simply concerned to get in the payments and to prevent such fights as might necessitate the calling in of the police. The furnished lodgings are much worse in character. They are rooms in tenement houses, fitted with the most meagre of sleeping accommodation, cleansed at rare intervals, overcrowded, it may be, at once by any number of people, and occupied, it may be, during the night, by many couples in succession. For each occupation, eightpence or tenpence is charged. Samuel Barnett's efforts to bring reform to the lawless streets around the church and vicarage met with official indifference. As Henrietta put it, the respectable and the happy preferred not to think of these matters. In December 1879, in an attempt to get the police to do more to keep order in the district, Samuel wrote to the Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, Sir Edmund Henderson, voicing his dissatisfaction at the policing of the East End. Henderson responded that... The police do all they can to keep violence and vice within bounds, but their duties are confined to the streets, and their efforts can do nothing to strike at the root of the evil, which is not to be found in the streets, but in the dens to which the abandoned criminal classes resort. An improvement in the moral surroundings of Whitechapel will be heartily welcomed by the police. In 1884, Henrietta and Samuel set up the Toynbee Hall University Settlement, named for their friend Arnold Toynbee, who had died the previous year. The aim of the settlement was to create a place at which future leaders and men of influence could live and work amongst the poor in order to gain an understanding of the causes of poverty which they could then take with them into national life. In 1885, the Toynbee men established a streets patrol committee tasked with monitoring the streets in the vicinity by night and with compiling reports on any law-breaking, antisocial behaviour or suspicious characters that they encountered. Henrietta published a sample of their reports in her book. September 16th, row between two men at 12.20am. Five minutes afterwards, in same place, found man bleeding from stab in neck, inflicted by a woman. Great noise from crowd. Man refused to charge woman. October 6th, disturbance in Fashion Street. Three women had been knocking about a drunken man who had a nasty gash on the left eye and was bleeding profusely. 1.15am, a woman created a disturbance in Wentworth Street. Lots of people about. 
October 9th, woman's head badly cut by a man. Charge brought next day, but not being supported by a woman, was dismissed. October 20th, saw four men and as many women enter one house in Flower and Dean Street. Two couples seem to leave the same house after being there 10 or 15 minutes. In every case, saw men stopped by women in the street. October 22nd, two women fighting in Thrall Street, man and woman fighting on second floor of house. October 29th, saw a woman dead drunk dragged along the length of the street. Summing up, Henrietta noted that the record from which these extracts are sufficient extends through many folios and bears witness to the disgrace and brutality to which men and women have fallen. The incidents related are of various kinds. Of some it would be a shame to speak. Some are of rows between the drunken, some of the escape of thieves protected by the whole community and welcomed at almost every door, some of assaults on strangers, some of dissoluteness shared in by boys and girls, some of open vice. Despite all the evidence that the Barnets were able to provide as to the lawless state of the streets, the police seemed unwilling or unable to take any action. And then, Henrietta continued, into deaf ears was loudly shouted the tale of the crimes of Jack the Ripper. Week after week came the news of fresh victims murdered silently, cruelly, scientifically, the butcher leaving no clue of his ghastly personality. The women were all of one profession, living their iniquitous lives openly. But, friendless and unbefriended as they were, horror at their fate awoke public interest, and people paused to ask what were the social conditions in Whitechapel which permitted such wickedness to take place. Verily, it was the crucifixion of these poor lost souls which saved the district. They saved others, themselves, they could not save. Is this blasphemy? No, it is written reverently and with a humble sense of the entanglement of human and divine influences. And, though I say with knowledge that the large majority of abandoned women are intentionally wicked, mean, lazy and destructive, yet I add with equal certainty that only those who know them personally and intimately, as I did by the hundred, can know the readiness to help, the capacity for sacrifice, the generosity of heart and the disregard of self that survives all the horrors of their lives in the characters of the small minority. The clearance of the slum district, consisting of Fashion Street, Flower and Dean Street, Thrall Street and George Street, gathered pace throughout the 1890s, albeit the last vestiges of them didn't disappear until into the 20th century. A modern housing estate now stands on the site of what were some of the most notorious thoroughfares in the Victoria metropolis, if not in the whole of Victorian Britain. The church and its vicarage, where Samuel and Henrietta Barnett were based, were demolished in the late 1920s, and the Canon Barnett Primary School now stands on their site. Toynbee Hall, however, still stands and is still carrying on the work begun by the Barnets. It seems out of sorts with its surroundings, much as it probably did back in the 1880s, but it is nonetheless a testimony to two people who came to Whitechapel, won over some of the criminally inclined members of the community and left the area a little better than it was when they arrived in 1873.